linear regression models are the most commonly used uh, and models both for prescriptive analytics of understanding what's going on and being able to change outcomes, but also predictive analytics, making use of them to, to predict the future. We've, uh, in the last couple of uh, videos, if you've been watching them, just introduced the model and understood how we interpret the parameters of those models. But kind of implicit in all of that was the fact that we, we're working with an estimate of the true model. And we have to take that into account when we think about the way in which we go about interpreting the coefficients and, and uh, I guess reminding ourselves of the uncertainty that's associated with any model. So here's the model, just uh, where we, we've got some outcome of interest, y, which we often refer to as our dependent variable, and that outcome, oops, turn my pen on. is related to a bunch of x's which we believe cause y and or that might be used able to be used for, to predict y if we're talking about predictive analytics. Um, the inputs can be referred to as causal variables or as explanatory variables and some places you also may see them as uh, independent variables just because that contrast with the dependent, y depends on x, x is independent of y, I guess. But more, most common probably is the use of the term explanatory variable or causal variables. The parameters of the model define the, if you like, marginal impacts of changing x, each of the x's on y, holding the other x's constant, they're like the slopes, and this parameter here is like the intercept. If I had all the x's equal to zero, that would predict what the value of y would be. The error is the the, the rest of human behaviour or uh, market behaviour or nature's outcomes, etc., which are not able to be captured by the model or left into the error. So that's the essential structure of a model. And in, the point we want to emphasise here is that the parameters that you've got in this model are population values and they're not known. So what we do is we take a sample and we estimate those parameters. So the parameters beta naught up to beta k are the true parameters. When we put hats on them, they become the estimates. And to reflect the fact that now these parameters are very important because they actually are what you use to predict if you're going to do predictive analytics. They're what you use to understand the mechanisms by which the inputs affect the output and therefore know what prescriptive uh, outcomes you might want to do. If you understand, if you learn, for example, that uh, based on one of these estimated parameters on the gender variable in a health outcome that men are in vastly inferior to women in terms of accessing health services for whatever reason, then you know you've got a clue as to what prescriptive actions you should take. What should we do to try and change that? So they have very important parameters, but they're only being estimated from a sample. So we have to remind ourselves of that uh, extra step in the process of estimation by doing things that you would have seen before if you've been watching earlier videos. videos. Think about confidence intervals to remind people that I'm only estimating and that the true estimate may be a bit bigger or a bit smaller than my estimate. And also to test hypotheses. And there's a particular hypothesis that we very commonly test about these parameters, namely that the, that the parameter itself is actually zero because a zero is value is very important here. Zero means no effect. So we'll come to that a bit later. So that's what we're going to think about for the next 15 minutes or so. The case study that we'll look at is uh, where y is the number of times you visit the doctor in a quarter and the x's are a bunch of things that, that are characteristics of a person that might influence that. How much income they earn, what gender they are, how many years of schooling they've got and what season of the year they were interviewed, whether it was winter, spring, summer or autumn. Here's the parameter est estimates that we get. So these numbers here are what in the previous video we spent quite a bit of time interpreting and there's quite a lot of information in those telling us whether or uh, how much effect it would have if you increased everybody's education on visits to the doctor, or how much of, is the difference between men and women, etc., etc. So those numbers are very important and, and shed a lot of light on what's going on. But they are parameter estimates, they're not the true parameters. So what we actually need to do is also have a look over the last couple of columns at the confidence intervals for those parameters. And that would, should kind of drive some of the interpretations that we have. So take the variable for male. We said before that coefficient was minus 0.75, which means that on average, 
two people with the same level of education, income, and visiting the doctor at the same, being interviewed at the same time of year, a male will visit the doctor 0.745 times less than a female. But in fact, the confidence interval tells us that the number that the, the the effect of being male versus female could be a lot bigger than that. It could be as many as 1.17 times less on average, or it could be weaker than that, less than that, minus 0.33 times. So we're 95% sure about what that true effect of male on doctor's visits is. It's we're 95% sure it's somewhere between 0.33 and 1.18 fewer doctor's visits per quarter on average. We can't say it's 0.75, that's only an estimate. Okay, so that's a fairly convoluted sentence, but that's the way you interpret a confidence interval for a slope parameter, in this case for the gender dummy male female. So you can see it's basically identical to, to interpreting, for those of you who've watched the previous video, it's virtually identical to the interpretation of the coefficient itself. It's just that instead of saying two people of the same income, education, the same time of year, one male and one female, the male will visit the doctor on average 0.75 times less. We say we estimate that the male will visit the doctor somewhere between 0.33 and 1.18 times less. Okay, so you've got a lot less certainty than what you had before, which is consistent with the fact that you're only doing an estimate. Okay, so that's all there is to talking about confidence levels in this case. Hypothesis testing is about the you can is, is analogous to the previous work that you would have seen in earlier lectures on hypothesis testing, but the hypothesis that we're particularly interested in looking at is whether or not any of these or slope parameters equals zero. Because if you go back to the model, if a particular value of one of these betas equals zero, then that x variable is no longer in the model. So if, let's see, which one was, uh, income is, is the first of them, so that's x1. Let me just check that. No, it's not 1, 2, 3. It's actually x1, x2, x3 in the model. Okay, so if x3 has a coefficient of beta 3, if beta 3 was zero, then in this equation here, that x variable would drop out. You know, if, if it's probably easier to see it with one of the ones that's actually here. So take this one here. If that number there is actually zero, then that variable drops out. So x1 is no longer a, a relevant variable in explaining y. That's important to know because if, you know, this is some model of, you know, is, is perhaps a performance of the firm, um, productivity and how it's compar comparing with other firms or likelihood of it going broke or something like that um, and X is one of the factors, X1 is one of the factors, it, you might think it's an important factor but a parameter value of zero would actually tell you that contrary to what you might have thought it's not an important factor. So it's a very important question to be asking. Does it really matter whether we you know, send our staff on this training course? Does it make any difference at all to their performance? In this context, do people with higher incomes actually visit the doctor more or less, or do they just visit the same? Now that particular question about income is an important one because it's it's a important public issue that a lot of times people say, oh, you know, medical services are very expensive and people can't, poor people can't afford them. Well, one way that we can address that question is to ask this question here, is there what we call an income gradient for access to health services, namely, Poor people can't afford to go to the doctor, so when you look at data like this, you would see a model, if it was just a two variable model with income here and doctor's visits with a slope like that, indicating richer people can afford it, so they go to the doctor more. So that's what we talk about an income gradient. That's the language of income gradient. So it's a, it's a commonly uh, asked policy question. And some countries of the world where health services are extremely expensive and there's not a sort of Medicare type of services or health, uh, public health insurance facility, then it's the evidence is very clear that indeed poor people just don't go to the doctor because they can't afford it. Um, in other countries where there's a really good public health system, often people find that there's no effective income, that whether you're rich or poor, you visit the doctor about the same on average. It doesn't depend on your income, it actually depends on how sick you are, etc. And that's a, that in terms of a sort of fair and equitable society, that's typically what people desire. So that very important question can be 
boil down to, in this particular case here, whether or not the parameter, the slope parameter for income is zero. And we've said greater than zero as our alternative because the public policy issue here is about whether or not people can afford to go to the doctor. So if there is an effective income, it'll be a positive effect. Richer people will go more. So we are looking for the alternative hypothesis being greater than zero. So how do we test a hypothesis like that? Well, it's exactly the same as what you've done in previous examples. First thing we do is we ask the question, because it's a one-sided test, whether the estimate is different to zero in the direction of the alternative, because it's a one-sided test. So the, the null hypothesis is zero. The alternative that we're interested in is out here. So if I got a value here, then I would say, well, there's no evidence against the null hypothesis. In other words, I got a negative value, if I got a negative value, because I'm looking for evidence out here somewhere. So the first check for any hypothesis test is, is to check whether or not the value of the parameter estimate is in the direction of the alternative. If it's not, if it was down here somewhere, then straight away, you don't even look at the p-value, you just do not reject the null. Okay, but because in this case we do have a positive value for beta 3 hat somewhere here, and that's in the direction of the alternative hypothesis, then we do have to calculate the p-value. So we get the p-value, it's 0.496 in the output. If you want to look at an earlier video, you'll see why we then need to take that p-value divided by 2. Very briefly, we have to do that because the p-value that's produced by Excel assumes you're doing a two-sided test. So it calculates the probability of this value or further from the null in the particular direction that it is, in this case greater than, and it doubles that quantity to assume that you might also go in the negative direction. Well, we don't want to double that quantity because we're only looking at one direction. So we have to take the Excel value, 0.496, and undo the doubling by dividing by two. You can't see it doing that doubling, it's all being done in the background, but that's the result, 0.496 is the result of that calculation. So we undo that by dividing by two, and that becomes the relevant p-value to look at for a one-sided test. Compare that to your significance level of 5%, which is the typical value that we choose, and you'd say it's it's not small enough, so therefore you do not reject H0. There is no evidence of an income gradient for health in this case. Okay, so that's how you do a hypothesis test. That's just one example. We could have performed the same kind of test on any of the other coefficients um, in exactly the same way. Simply look at the p-values. If it's a two-sided test, that's your p-value. If it's a one-sided test, you've got to divide it by two and ask the question, which of these X variables matters? Education clearly does matter. There is a very small p-value there. Gender clearly does matter. So men do go to the doctor on average a different, or in fact less, much many fewer times than women. There's strong evidence against the null hypothesis of no gender difference, if you like, and so on. Okay, so that's uh, two ways in which we think about taking account of the uncertainty, the two ways that we've already come across in other recordings where we think about estimating a parameter with a, with a sample quantity, we think about reminding people that this is a sample estimate by giving them not just one number but a confidence interval to tell them how uncertain we are about our estimate, and then secondly using the sample information to test particular hypotheses about certain things, and the particular hypothesis that's most relevant in linear regression is whether or not that parameter value can legitimately be considered to be different to zero, or because zero means no effect of x on y, and that's why it's so important. All right, thanks for listening.